Currently, R1A is one of the most frequent patrilineal lineages in Eurasia. Over 90% of those who carry paternal lineage R1A fall into the Z645 subclade, which formed 3500 years before the Common Era, which roughly corresponds to early European Bronze Age. At this point, this patrilineal lineage only existed in Europe. This is a relevant point to mention, as South Asian subclades of R1A descend from RZ645 through its daughter clade Z93. Moving on back to Z645, it is found all over Eurasia at a frequency of 52% among Pashtuns, 41% among Kyrgyz, 29-50% among the Poles, 20-55% among the Russians, 28% among the Slovenes, and 19% among the Norwegians. All of these people from Norway to Sri Lanka descend directly from one Bronze Age man who lived somewhere in Russia 35 centuries before the Common Era. The earliest samples that are explicitly Z645 are all corded ware samples from Europe. All these samples are in the 28th century to 20th century BC time period, way after the TMRCA for Z645. One copper individual, though, from Ukraine, sample ID I6561, whose trade predictor results you will see later in this video, had Z645 lineage and even Z Z93 lineage, which is the uh, child clade of Z645, which sort of contradicts the TMRCA for the subclade, as the sample is dated to 38 to 34 centuries before the Common Era, which would make him literally either the first carrier of the subclade or indicate some kind of calculation error for the TMRCA of the sample, uh, for the TMRCA of the haplogroup or the samples dating. Most likely, the problem is with the samples dating. Z645 is the predominant subclade in corded ware men. Both the Indo Iranian Z93 and the Slavic Z282 descend from this subclade. The earliest samples with the Indo Iranian Z93 are corded ware folks from Eastern Europe namely the Fatianovo culture. The TMRCA for Z93 is 29 centuries before the Common Era, uh, but quoting Wikipedia, according to archaeologist David Anthony, the paternal R1A Z93 was found at the Askol River near our no longer existing Kalkhoz Alexandria in Ukraine, circa 40 centuries before the Common Era. Do you see what is wrong with this statement? How can a sample from 40 centuries before the Common Era carry a haplogroup that formed 29 centuries before the Common Era. This sample is indeed a mystery. Uh, I think the mystery is solved very simply by um, assuming that they probably made a mistake in providing the timeline of the sample's life uh, when it lived. In regards to the European Z282, um, the earliest samples with this subclade are I11953 from the early Unities culture and Tzginiec genomes, which I've made videos about. Uh, Zhinyets was kind of an offshoot of Unity's culture that uh, existed in uh, late Bronze Age in Poland. <laughs> Z282 is most commonly found in Eastern Europe and is practically absent from South and Central Asia. Z93 is present all over Asia but is not really found in modern Europeans. Both the subclades nonetheless originated in Europe. So now we are going to move on to the DNA results of this mysterious Ukrainian sample. As you can see, their Y-DNA is indeed Z645. Uh, and if you upload them to uh, YSEC clade finder, it will say the precise subclade, which is Z93, which is really wild. It's crazy because the sample is dated. I will remind you four millennia before the common era. Uh, it is dated to the Copper Age, to the Eneolithic. And it has it supposedly has Z93. So uh, let's go ahead and explore the results with my trade predictors, ethnic calculator, and GED match. And this will really settle the whole matter. Uh, because if you look at the, this sample's GED match result, everything becomes really clear. So first with ethnic calculator results with uh, the um, uh, trade predictor, which I made, he is closest to Sarmatians from the Urals and Eneolithic Sarazan people from Tajikistan. It's kind of, it's not saying much. You don't get much information out of my ethnicity calculator. The ethnicity calculator is not the strongest point of my trade predictor. But now let's, let's look at the GED match. So, so you see his GD match result here, and it is very apparent that this is not an Eneolithic sample from Ukraine. It is very apparent that this individual has European farmer admixture and steppe admixture. Uh, it is very clear that this is a corded ware individual. It's not a, um, it, it's not four millennia before the Common Era. It is most likely uh, around two millennia later. 
than what he was dated as. So the problem, 100%, the problem is with the dating. Uh, let's see the Oracle. And you see with the Oracle, he is closest to Nordic battle axe culture. So this is clearly somebody who is not an Enneolithic person. This is not an Enneolithic person from Ukraine, from Eastern Ukraine. No way. Uh, this is somebody who um, uh, who lived in probably second millennia before the Common Era. So uh, what about uh, what what other things here about the sample that start to make sense once you take into this context that it's mislabeled? The time period is mislabeled. It, they something went wrong with their algorithm. However, they date these samples. It was misdated. Once you take in this into account, uh, everything becomes clear. For example, here, uh, this individual is heterozygous for European lactose persistence mutation. If you did not know that this sample was misdated, you might have assumed that this is the earliest uh, sample with European lactose persistence, but it's not because it's misdated, because it is it lived uh, closer to the modern period than what it was dated as. It is more it is more modern. It was it is more recent than what it was dated as. So let's see what he looked like. We're gonna start with uh, Nasha Kot. Uh, I'm sure you guys would be interested in that. So the most the phenotypes he most likely resembles are these three. These are the top phenotypes for him. Very interesting. Uh, and well, uh, the phenotypes the phenotype pictures are not all that good to be honest. I just started working on them. Uh, they will get better. Um, it will be more responsive in regards to like your ancestry. It will be it will take into account your ancestry as well, not just what your eye color, hair color, and skin color and hair texture is. And I actually added nose shape as well. Uh, it doesn't show up here on the screen, uh, but there is a calculation for nose shape now as well, and it it goes uh, into this calculation for the phenotype, which is pretty interesting. Um, tell me in the comments if I should display the nose shape on the screen, but. Uh, it looks like for the eye color distribution, this individual has hazel eyes, most likely hazel or brown eyes. Uh, green eyes and blue eyes with an amber center are also pretty possible, but most likely his eye color is hazel or brown. Um, for hair color, it looks like his hair color is most likely dark brown, 73% likelihood of that. There is a small chance of black hair and light brown hair, but most likely his hair color is dark brown. For skin color prediction, it looks like most likely his skin color is olive or Mediterranean. There is a a slight possibility of light brown or white skin as well, but it's most likely all over Mediterranean. And for hair texture, he most likely has curly hair. There's actually a pretty significant likelihood of kinky hair as well, which I think it would be lower if the sample was higher in quality. It's not an it's not a very low quality sample, but it's it could be higher in quality. For coloring related variants found in the file, very interesting. He's heterozygous for blue eye haplotype two, uh, and he does not have blue eye haplotype three. This looks like a very typical like coloring of a corded wear person. It, it's very typical coloring for corded wear. It is it it would be very, very atypical coloring for um a step for an Enneolithic person from the step. Really, really atypical. So definitely not an Enneolithic person from the step. All the signs in the file point to this being a corded wear individual. Um and not an Enneolithic individual. Uh GED match, clearly not an Enneolithic step individual with GED match. Uh, clearly not an Enneolithic step individual with coloring, lactose persistence, even haplogroup is against that. So I'm not sure uh, why it is counted as being a Enneolithic sample, copper age sample. Right, doesn't have BH4, and it looks like he has he has two light color variants here in SLC24A5. So he got the Eurasian light skin variants in SLC24A5. Heterozygous genotype in ASIP, so once again, intermediate color of skin. Uh, he does have two light color variants in this variation of SLC 45A2, so this leads to lighter color of skin, eyes, and hair. Um, okay, is there anything else interesting here? Uh, no, not really. I don't see anything interesting too much. Doesn't have any derived variants in MC1R, so he doesn't have any predisposition to being ginger. All right, now let's check his polygenic risk scores and his diseases, so his monogenic traits, and we're going to be done there. So for the polygenic risk scores, it looks like he's got a super high score for schizophrenia. Wow, that's interesting. So he's got a high score for schizophrenia, um, one of the highest I've seen so far. He's got a below average score for type 2 diabetes. He's got a slightly above average score for Alzheimer's. He's got a below average score for multiple sclerosis. It looks like for the cancer section, two risk variants for breast cancer out of six, which is kind of kind of not good. But then again, six out of six is not a, is not a very... Uh, there isn't much data in the file, right? So we can't really trust this prediction too much. It's not a very reliable prediction. Four risk variants for testicular cancer at F12. Once again, there's not that much data in the file. 
four out of 12 sounds good, but we can't really know for sure because it's only 12. It's only out of 12. The total, the max that you can get if you have a really high quality file is out of 30 something. So, you know, it's not obviously, uh, this is not the best quality file. For celiac disease, one out of eight, which is pretty good. For GSS, zero out of zero. R literally nothing for GSS was found in this file, unfortunately. For Crohn's, four out of 22 for Crohn's, which is really good. For Reifenstein's, zero out of zero. Once again, nothing for Reifenstein's was even found in the file. For Parkinson's, three out of eight, which is kind of bad. But we don't know how valid this is because, um, because, because the, the max is like 50-something, right? So uh, he's scoring eight. Uh, he, Eight variants were found out of 50-something. This tells you how low quality this file is, or I mean how low coverage the file is when it comes to the relevant variations for Parkinson's. All right. Now let's explore his monogenic traits. It looks like he's got GG in comt valmet variation, meaning warrior genotype in, in COMT, but warrior genotype in MAOA. So overall, those kind of cancel out. He's probably got intermediate genotype um, phenotype between warrior and warrior, intermediate speed of dopamine reuptake. It looks like he does not have any no-go learning variants in the early to spirofrenetin pro, which means higher number of dopamine due to receptor sites in the brain and higher odds of schizophrenia. He is not genotyped. He is not genotyped for TOC1, unfortunate. Uh, but he's got this genotype, which leads to slightly lower odds of schizophrenia, also in DRD2, which is very interesting. Um, I wasn't sort of expecting that here. Um, it looks like he does not have long-form 5-HTTLPR. Okay, so he's got short-form 5-HTTLPR, slightly higher odds of depression. Uh, slightly higher or like basically average odds of depression. We're going to skip autism. For DDC, we're going to skip that. For lactose persistence, I've already talked about this. He's heterozygous for this variation of MCM6, uh, which means he is heterozygous for the European lactose persistence mutation and is probably not lactose intolerant. A uh, very surprising genotype for somebody from Eneolithic steppe, but very typical and expected genotype for somebody who is a corded wear person. For OXTR, it looks like he's got um, heterozygous genotype in this variation of OXTR, one sociopath and one empath variant. All right, um, likely intermediate between sociopathic and empathetic. Uh, personality personality types. For diabetes, it looks like he does not have type 1 diabetes. Really good to see. Nothing was found for hemochromatosis. Really unfortunate. For Alzheimer's, it looks like he's got uh, no risk variance in APOE. Really good to see. For multiple sclerosis. For multiple sclerosis, you really only need a couple genotypes in the HLA gene because they're all so closely related to each other. They're so closely linked to each other. If you know one, you pretty much know all the other ones. So it looks like he does not have risk variance in HLA. Really good to see. Uh, we're going to skip cardiovascular. For my, We're going to skip myopia. Uh, we're going to talk about miscellaneous section. No micropenis. Really good to see. Better performing muscles, likely sprinter rather than endurance athlete. Really good to see. No fat gene variants and FTOs, RS99, 39609. So he's not predisposed to obesity. There is a separate fat gene panel at the bottom. Uh, we're going to see if he has any fat gene variants in the other variations of FTO. Probably not. It looks like he also does not have uh, shovel shaped incisors and he's not East Asian in ancestry based on his genotype in EDAR. He has European genotype in EDAR. He's also not an Asian flusher and he's got lower odds of alcoholism. Um, okay, uh, very European. For drug response, we're going to skip that. Uh, albinism, it looks like he does not have any variants for albinism. He's not albino. For familiar Mediterranean fever, it looks like he does not have any risk variants for familiar Mediterranean fever. Uh, for MTHFR, it looks like he's got a genotype that leads to. Uh, good stuff. Slightly lower than average odds for a variety of illnesses from autism to coronary heart disease. For cancer panel, this is the these are the risk variances in breast, breast cancer that he does have. So it looks like not a lot of relevant stuff was found for cancers for both breast and testicular cancer. Only one variation was found for testicular cancer. So uh, it's not a, there's not much to talk about here. It's it's an, an incomplete result. For leukemia panel, he's got the genotype which leads to lower risk of leukemia. This is one of the like five genotypes that you can score. So it looks like. A lot of the relevant stuff is simply absent from the file. Rare diseases in traits panel looks like not a lot of the relevant stuff is here. In fact, none of it is here. Uh, for celiac disease, it looks like he's got one risk variant for celiac disease, but this is pretty common. The risk variants here are pretty common, so it doesn't matter all that much. Uh, for androgen receptor gene AR panel, it looks like he's got this GG gene type in 61, uh, 52, which leads to typical or slightly higher than average odds of boldness. It's very European. Europeans tend to have this genotype. Europeans tend to have these higher odds of boldness. But Sub-Saharan Africans and East Asians, on the other hand, tend to have the um, genotype that protects from boldness. So in this, in this case, if you're a European, you most likely have the same genotype here as well. Crohn's disease, nothing relevant was found in the file. Well, we did remember that something relevant was found, but out of the three the most important variations that I print on the screen, none of those were found. None of the most important variations were found in the file. 
For Canavan syndrome, it looks like no risk variance for that, although there's typically a lot more. Uh, and for HIV and AIDS panel, this is really good to see. He's got one protective variant in this variation, which leads to 60% reduction in HIV viral load. Uh, really pleasant stuff to see. So he's a little bit protected from HIV. It's a very European trait. Um, it, it has been suggested by uh, academics that these protective variants in Europeans that protect from HIV might have developed during the Black, Black Plague. Uh, when um, Europeans had to sort of adapt and, and survive because this protective variance apparently provides some protection from the Black Plague as well. But I completely disagree with that because I've seen, uh, I've, I've at this point processed like 20 or 25 different files from um, Anatolian Neolithic farmers, and most of them had one or two protective variants here. And Anatolian Neolithic farmers lived in a time period way before the Black Plague or any of that stuff. So uh, I think these protective variants are not from adaptations to the Black Plague, although it's a good guess. I don't think it's correct. For muscular dystrophy myopathies, it looks like he doesn't have any risk variants for that, and nothing was found for ADL, really unfortunate. For color blindness panel, it looks like nothing was found for OPN1LW and OPN1MW, but he does have one risk variant in OPN1SW. Very interesting. So maybe there is a little bit of a predisposition to color blindness here as well. For FTOG panel, it looks like he does not have any risk variants for obesity in FTO. And he's got this genotype, which leads to slightly higher BMI. Very interesting. This is actually kind of uncommon. I don't see the allele here very, very frequently. Uh, and for BioTrades panel, there, it looks like not, not a lot of relevant stuff is found here. Uh, there is this genotype, which leads to higher risk of male pattern boldness. And there's this genotype, which leads to the lower predisposition to anger. That's pretty much all there is for this individual, for this sample. Well. Uh, thanks for watching my video until the end. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Um, and you can download this file in 23 andme format from link which is in the description of the video. I am so glad that I answered this question, this mystery. I solved the mystery of a sample that's uh, supposedly in Neolithic and has Z93. There you go.